You've been comprehensive in terms of how you've broken down the SVB story on your Twitter handle, and you've been really incisive in terms of pointing out two particular factors. I'm thinking about technology and liquidity, and then the mismatch between deposits and, of course, what you're getting in money markets. Just break down what the implications are for those two factors coming to play. Yeah, so from the technology standpoint, welcome to the era of mobile banking. How did SVB get $42 billion withdrawn on Friday alone when there was no images of people lined up in front of the bank? It's this thing right here. It's our phone. I already had one tech VC told me he opened an account with JP Morgan and transferred $200 million in 10 minutes. So the banking system has to understand that the $17 trillion of money, everybody's sitting here with their thumb ready to move it at a moment's notice. And so they have to come to grips that this new technology has removed the friction of moving your money from one account to another or one institution to another at lightning speed. And so this is going to be something regulators and bankers are going to have to kind of get their head around. As far as liquidity goes, the bigger issue here is that for 14 years we had zero interest rates. Bankers that are now running these banks are used to a zero interest rate world. When rates started to rise, because of all the QE, they said, I have enough reserves, I don't need any more assets. So they kept their rates at zero. As rates went to two, three, four percent, customers didn't move. But then at five percent, something happened. The money flow, the gates opened and money started flowing into money market funds. They started buying treasury bills because five percent versus half a percent, then they started to move. And that has now created this liquidity drain at all banks, but the most weak, the weaker ones, like a signature or like an SVB, they're the ones that we found having the problems first. That bigger problem still consists now that everybody's still looking around and saying, even after the sell-off, I can still get a 4.5% um, T-bill yield. I can still get 4% on a traditional money market why don't I leave my bank and go to that? So, Jim, first of all, um, the First Republic Bank shares in pre-market are up 20 percent. We'll talk about regulation. We'll talk about Tier 1 and Tier 2 banks and what that means going forward. But do you think the bank run will continue? The bank run will continue, but maybe not to the point that you will get a failure. You got to ask yourself, and this gets to this whole idea that there, there, it's a two-tier banking system. Tier one is the four big cannot right. too fail. Too big to fail. Right, too big to fail banks, the cities, the uh, J.P. Morgan's, Wells Fargo's, B of A. Tier two is everybody else. Tier one, you are a depositor with that bank because they're too big to fail. And but tier two, are you an unsecured creditor or are you a, po a, a, a depositor? If you perceive yourself as an unsecured creditor, which are a lot of these large companies do that are well over the $250,000 limit, why, why wouldn't you move to a tier one bank? So I think a lot of people are going to make that calculation and they're going to say, okay, my bank is not going to fail tomorrow, but they're offering me half a percent. And if they do run into trouble, but what's the downside for me to move my money to Chase? There's no downside. It's 10 minutes on my phone. And that's what bankers are going to have to deal with.